Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. Before I continue, I'd like to mention that our Patreon is set up. You can go to patreon.com slash CanadaX, that's E-H-X, where we have multiple tiers of various support that you can provide to help keep this podcast going. There was once a community that produced some extremely notable Canadians. It was vibrant and a major part of the history of Nova Scotia. It existed for almost 150 years until it was wiped off the map. It was a community that dealt with racism, industrial waste, and much more. It was Africville, and its history is one of freedom, struggle, and persevering against the odds. I'll be talking with Matthew McRae, the curator of history at the PEI Museum and Heritage Foundation, and Juanita Peters, the executive director of the Africville Museum. Considered to be one of the first free black communities outside Africa, the settlement was founded by black loyalists, who were former slaves in the American colonies that had escaped their masters and were freed by the British during the American Revolutionary War. The British transported these loyalists to Nova Scotia, providing them with land and supplies for their service. The history of Halifax itself, right next to Africville, is one that centers on the African slaves that dug out the roads and built much of the city. There is some evidence that states that those who built the roads lived in Bedford Basin, which would one day be Africville. There is also evidence that the Maroons of Jamaica lived there. In 1761, the first official record of the area of Africville appears when land was granted to several white families who imported and sold African slaves. The settlers would settle in the area of what would one day be Africville, but Africville was never really formally established. In 1836, an access road was built that allowed for access to the north side of the Halifax Peninsula, and the first land transaction to be documented on paper would appear in 1848, and one year later, the Seaview United African Baptist Church would be established in Africville. This church served as the focal point for the community. Everything from picnics to funerals and weddings to sports events were held near this church. It was literally the heart of the community. For much of the 19th century, Africville was a poor but self-sufficient community with about 50 to 100 people. Originally, it was not known as Africville, but as the Campbell Road Settlement, owing to the name of the road that came to the community. The name Africville started to pop up around 1900. Those around the area thought it was called Africville, believing that the people there came from Africa. But according to one elderly resident of the community, none came from Africa, all came from northern Halifax. But other residents just called it Africville because it's where the black people lived. It is likely white residents of Halifax called the village African Village, which became Africville over time. The first two generations that lived in the community did not have much. Most of the men found work in low-paying jobs, while some worked as seamen and cleaning train cars. In the community during the early 19th century, only 35% of the laborers had regular employment, while 65% worked as domestic servants. Women often worked as cooks or were hired to clean the hospital or prison. Many residents ran farms, operated small stores, or fished in Bedford Basin. Matthew McRae helps explain some of the history and the lack of records from this point. Records of the black presence in Africville date back as far as 1848. Uh, and there's no reason to believe that there wasn't, wasn't a black presence before that. We just don't have any um, government records. But as we know, government records, uh, especially at that time, were very often biased uh, against, for example, black people or indigenous people, they only usually appeared in the records if there was a legal issue, mm -hmm. you know, either that uh, the state had considered a black person to have committed a crime or, you know, had wanted their land or had some affair with them. So otherwise, they tended to be ignored in the official records. So it makes it difficult sometimes to do that kind of history. But we know that for at least 150 years, uh, Africville was a thriving African American or African Canadian community, I should say. In 1883, the first elementary school was built, and it was only at the expense of the community who saved the money to create the school because there was no educational opportunities in Africville until then. Due to the poverty of the community, it was not until 1933 that the teachers at the school had any formal training, and only 40% of the children received any schooling. Most children had to work or take care of a younger sibling at home, while parents worked. Only 140 children were ever registered through the school, and 60 made it to grade 7 or 8, but only 4 boys and 1 girl made it to grade 10. In 1894, the Africville Seasides hockey team emerged as one of the teams in the new Coloured Hockey League that had existed from 1895 to 1930. 
This league was one of the first to allow goalies to leave their feet to make a save, and it was also where the first slap shot was pioneered. As for the Africville Seasides, they would win the league championship in 1901 and 1902, led by star goaltender William Caveri. In 1917, Africville would reach its largest population with 400 people. Unfortunately, that was the same year as the Halifax Explosion, the largest unplanned man-made explosion in history. And you can hear all about this explosion on This Is A Disaster podcast from an episode they did in November. At the time of the explosion, the community was made up of buildings that were small and often well-maintained by residents, as well as other buildings that were a little more than sheds. The elevated land to the south of Africville actually protected the community from the worst of the explosion that killed 2,000 people, but Africville still suffered heavy damage and four residents were killed. One doctor at the time of the explosion went to Africville and noted residents were wandering around in shock amid the destroyed buildings and homes. As for Halifax itself, it would rebuild following the explosion, and Africville only received a small amount of relief funds from the city, and none of the reconstruction or modernization the rest of the city received. A look at the life of Africville comes from people like Elsie Desmond, who was born in Africville in 1911, and had to go to work when she had finished school as a cleaner. She said in the excellent book, Traditional Lifetime Stories, the following, We walked to work. In winter, snow up to our knees, but we would make it. We didn't make money except when we had special jobs to clean recreational halls. We got four or five dollars then. But usually we got potatoes, turnips, carrots, what was cooked for dinner. We would receive the cooked food in our baskets to take home. But that kept us alive, and I say people should never forget where they came from. Some people were fortunate, but we were not. I worked for what I got. Elsie went on in her recollection to talk about the community itself and its strong connection. We stuck together on things. We had a group called the Odd Fellows, and they had meetings and did community work. If there were any disasters or problems in the families that needed help, the community chipped in and did their part. If someone's house burnt down, the people would get together and rebuild it. In talking about the Halifax explosion, Elsie states, We went upstairs in our house because we were getting ready for school. That saved us because downstairs was ruined completely. Flying glass cut me on the neck, and my sister got cut in the nose and half her ear got cut off. My mother had just called my second oldest sister to come upstairs when the blast went off. She had been killed if she hadn't come upstairs. Africville was completely destroyed. Halifax, for the most part, chose to ignore Africville, or treat it with contempt. For most of its history, it would not receive proper roads, health services, streetlights, electricity, or water from the city. Residents protested to the city for proper sanitation and drinking water, but they were ignored. The water wells were contaminated on such a frequent basis because of the lack of these services that residents usually had to boil water before drinking it or using it for cooking. The irony is that Halifax collected taxes from Africville, but did not provide services that taxes pay for. Halifax would look to Africville for one thing though, and that was a place to put things they did not want. Property values were low and the people had little in the way of political power which allowed those who ran Halifax to do what they wanted with the community without giving the community anything it needed. Halifax would put its prison there in 1853. A railway extension was put through the middle of the village without consultation in 1854, followed by an infectious disease hospital in 1870. A slaughterhouse and a fecal waste depository was also built. This wasn't just something that happened in the 19th century either. In the 1930s, residents petitioned the city for basic needs such as running water, sewage disposal, paved roads, electricity, police, and garbage removal. These requests were ignored. Matthew McRae elaborates. Halifax refused to provide most amenities that other Haligonians took for granted. You know, sewage, access to clean water, garbage disposal, and in fact, as you pointed out, they moved a lot of undesirable facilities close to, within proximity of Africville, for example, the dump, um, you know, uh, uh, an infectious disease hospital. I think there was a prison there too, I believe. So there was just all these facilities that, you know, uh, I think in most communities would, if those were built around them, they'd be concerned about, you know, the value of their land. They'd be concerned about the safety of their community. Uh, but these were put around Africa, I think, because it was a black community. And again, racism played a part, uh, well, played the part in in that. Uh, Residents of Africville did advocate for themselves and push to have better services delivered, but those uh, those efforts were usually responded to with silence from the city of Halifax. It should be noted that the housing in Africville varied immensely. 
Some people lived in small homes in need of repair, while others had larger houses that would be classified as middle class. One former resident stated that her house had a family parlor, plastic w plaster walls, a piano, and a dining room table. Media in the area would undermine the sense of community in Africville. Articles presented the area as a place of just dilapidated houses and no residents. In an opinion piece by Frank Doyle of the Halifax Mail Star in 1963, it's highlighted. He states, A few years ago, three children perished when their home was consumed. The city has full power to order these demolished, and if owners fail to raise them, it can do so if the buildings are not up to the sleazy minimum standards supposedly demanded of all property owners everywhere but in Africville. If less attention were paid to the isolated, decrepit sheds and unusable garages and more to huts, which pose a constant threat to several hundred persons, the city would be safer. An article in Time magazine in 1962 did the same, referring to the community as a slum with no redeeming qualities, and talking down to the residents who live there. The article states, Such subletities are academic to the 370 people of Halifax, Africville, a shanty town caught between the tracks and the dump in the city's north end. Nearly half of Canada's Negroes live in a score of communities, mostly segregated in Nova Scotia. The crudest, by general agreement, is Africville. Settled more than a century ago by descendants of slaves brought to Nova Scotia by United Empire Loyalists, Africville is built of wood and tin shacks. In 1958, the city moved the garbage dump and landfill to Africville. The city looked at several locations, but decided that the dump could not be placed in Fairview, a white area of Halifax. One city alderman stated that the dump was a health menace and could not be placed in Fairview. Instead, the dump was placed only 350 metres from the edge of Africville. There appears to be no mention of the impact on health of Africville residents in the council minutes relating to this decision. Eddie Carveri, who has been protesting the treatment of Africville for decades, said the following about the dump. The hospital would just dump their raw garbage on the dump. Bloody body parts, blankets and everything. We were subject to that and then they would just burn this dump every so often. There would be walls of fire and toxic smoke, and we used to run through that fire to get to the metals before they melted because we scavenged off the dump. We had to. You had to do that to survive. The residents of Afriville knew they could do nothing to stop the dump from being located where they lived, so they began to go to the dump illegally to salvage goods that they could sell, including copper, brass, steel, and tin. Kaveri also stated that rats were incredibly common in Africville because of the dump, he said there were as many as 100,000 at any given time, stating, It looked like the dump was alive. It looked like a rug. Once rats started to migrate to the white area, exterminators came to the dump and covered it in rat poison. Kaveri stated, We breathed it. It was in the air. It was on our clothes. Now we're all dying of cancer. Today it is believed that the dump was put in Africville to push residents out on their own accord. When this didn't happen, the city took a different path with Africville. The dump also allowed the city to classify the area as a slum, which leads us to the next chapter of the history of Africville. Africville schools would be closed in 1953, and children had to be bused into city schools, but they were only allowed to take the bus until they were 12 years old. At this point, Africville children were forced to walk to school. In the book, Halifax, Warden of the North, there are only three mentions of Africville in the entire book, despite the long history of Africville to Halifax. All the mentions paint Africville as a community that ruins the site of Halifax. In the book, it is stated, Willow Park, a beautiful residential site facing Bedford Basin, was marred by the grim city prison and the squalid shacks of Africville. In 1962, the CBC interviewed two residents of Africville about having to move, in an interview that seemed somewhat hostile in terms of the interviewer. Why do you stay here? What, what are the attractions to you? Well, all attractions is fishing and boating. You're right on the water, of course. That's right, yeah. Joseph Skinner, railway porter, and his Africville neighbor, Mrs. Emma Steep. What else now? Well, we're at this fair, we're free here. We, we're, not with this, uh, we're not mixed up with this uh, uh, environment of uh, prejudice or anything. We're people by ourselves. You don't feel that you're uh, sort of segregating yourselves by continuing to live here? No. No, we're not. We mix with the people. We go town shopping. We've got a shop in town. All our business is done in the city. But you, you're suggesting that when you do go into the city, you expect to run into prejudice and, and the results of prejudice, discrimination, do you? That's right. Yeah. Now, Mrs. Steed, uh, what kind of discrimination do you people run into? Well, one, one 
main point is we have the facilities that the people in to the city have. You're suggesting that the city has denied you denied some of the services that are yes. general elsewhere. What, yes. for instance? You have electricity, yes. you have telephone, yes. TV here. What don't you have? We have a sewage. We have no water. No sewage, no water. No water. Your water comes from, from wells. Wells. Yeah. How many wells would there be in Africa? Well, we've got, well, I'll say about three that we really can rely on, depending. Well, now, why haven't you people got these services that other people have? Well, why should 400 people here go without a uh, sewage system, water? I, I want to know why you think you had you don't have these things. It's part of the discrimination, I think. You mean that somebody is, uh, you believe that Someone has sat down at City Hall and says, because these people are colored, we will not give them sewage, we will not give them water. <laughs> Frankly, I find this a bit hard to believe, and I'm wondering why really. you are so sure That's of it. why. As long as you're from Africa, okay, we get any, no help of any kind from the city. This, of course, would make, I would think, an, an excellent industrial site. Yes. Why not sell to the city at a, presumably a fair price and uh, move elsewhere? where you would have sewers and, and water and so on. Why, why not do that? No, I don't think that's a very good idea at all. It's not for that. Well, they, the city wants to redevelop it over our people, and I don't think that's fair. I think we should have a chance to redevelop our property as well as anybody else. It's our property for the, for the last 200 years. You you prefer to stay in the city? Yes, within the city limits, we know what want want to live in the city limits because we be a part of the city and I think we should be living in the city. If uh, we were moved from here, we want some place within the city limits. You think of yourselves first as Haligonians, do you? Rather yes. than Africa people? That's what we are, Haligonians. In 1962, Halifax City Council adopted a resolution to relocate the people of the community. The relocation took place from 1964 to 1967 and the people were transported out with their possessions using the dump trucks of the city. For many, it was the perfect metaphor for how they were treated by the city of Halifax all their lives. There was no meaningful consultation with Africville residents to get their views on the move. The Halifax Human Rights Advisory Committee was put in charge of consulting with the community, but this was not done and it was later reported that 80% of residents had never even had contact with the committee. Many residents felt that the city was only destroying the community, not to turn it into an industrial site, but to get rid of the concentration of black Canadians. In the book mentioned above, Halifax, Warden of the North, the relocation is painted as such. Of all the areas marked for redevelopment, the most obvious was Africville, whose 370 inhabitants were mostly of Negro descent. Theirs was a squalid shack town without piped water or sewer facilities, on the shore of Bedford Basin where their predecessors had squatted more than a century before. Here was a sad problem. The people of Africville wanted to stay where they were, and as a Negro community. The Stevenson Report said firmly, Despite the wishes of many of the residents, it would seem desirable on social grounds to offer alternative housing in other locations within the city. The city is a comprehensive urban community, and it is not right that any segment of the community shall exist in isolation. Only 14 residents had clear legal titles to their land, so most residents received $500, or $4,000 today. They were also given an allowance for moving to buy things like furniture. For young families, it was easy to move, but older residents often refused to leave the community they had called home for decades. As soon as residents moved from a house, the city came in and demolished it. The city would even take the opportunity to demolish a house if a resident left for some reason, like going to the hospital. Other residents only had a few hours' notice to leave before the bulldozers came through. The church, which had stood for over a century, was demolished on November 20th, 1967, in the middle of the night. This was done before the city actually owned the building. The documentation for the church sale stated it was bought in 1968, but the page was edited to forge the sale and state that the city bought it in 1967. The church was bulldozed with many vital records inside, which would have helped prove many land claims. This woman talks about the loss of her community as it happened in 1967. I, I've been here so long, you know, it doesn't make any difference to me. But it's 
they're young people, they got their life to live. Well, I'm over that now. My woman my age. All I'm putting my trust in God to uh, spare me. I don't know what hour or what minute I may go. But still, I, I love my home. And this house here was one of the best houses in the segment. Because it was plastered all through and high before and the basement is higher than the, than the upstairs. And so, I just want to make up my mind now. I got to leave it someday. The last home to be demolished would happen on January 2nd, 1970. Elsie Desmond would relate in her retelling the following. Bulldozers destroyed the houses and garbage trucks carried our belongings. I didn't like it and I hated to see my home gone. Those who were given money found that they did not get very far when paying for rent or a down payment on a house. Work was still hard to come by and those Africville residents who stayed in Halifax soon found themselves on welfare due to the rising cost of living in the city. Other former residents moved to places like Montreal, Toronto and Winnipeg. While Halifax would hail the demolition, the truth was that it was far from something kind done to other humans, as this CBC interview from 1976 states, with Dan Claremont talking about a study that looked at the relocation. So I, I did come in to the picture with uh, rather idealistic and contemporary viewpoints on, on the thing, and uh, you're, you're quite right that Idealistic social science is perhaps that, the good way to describe it. The study showed eventually that the Africville relocation was a disaster. It wasn't, I don't think, a reflection of the meanness of people, but it was a reflection of where they were at with respect to lifestyle. This predisposed intellectuals, whether they were on the Human Rights Commission, whether they were fine men like Borhoi, whether they were housing experts, or whether they were sociologists like me in those days, it predisposed us not to see the, the small community uh, as a viable thing, as a worthwhile thing, not to see roots as, as good and viable. Most things follow from that one basic fault, which was the failure to see anything of any value in, in the community. The history of Africville was deep, and some came from the community to make names for themselves in the world. George Dixon, regarded as the greatest featherweight boxer in history, was born in 1870 in Africville and today is celebrated as one of the greatest athletes to come from Nova Scotia. Reverend Addie Eilstock was born in the community in 1909 and would go on to become the first woman minister to be ordained by the British Methodist Episcopal Church and the first black woman to be ordained in Canada. In addition, many notable people came to the community from time to time. In the 1960s, legendary boxer Joe Lewis was in Halifax and asked where the black people lived. He was told Africville, and he went and visited the community himself. Duke Ellington also came to the community to visit where his father-in-law had lived. Ellington stayed with some family in the community during his visit. And here's Juanita Peters. Well, I mean, people uh, from Africville uh, had many jobs around, made many contributions uh, to not just Halifax, but to Canada. Um, uh, Portia White was not from Halifax, but she was an internationally uh, acclaimed um, uh, singer, uh, opera singer, who taught in Africville. You have George Dixon, who is an internationally known boxer who was from Africville. Uh, I could go on and on and on. Um, so the, the contributions made by people of Africville is quite significant. Uh, and the, uh, the role that people played just in everyday lives uh, was really quite significant as well. Africville may have ceased to exist in 1970, but it was not forgotten. In the 1980s, the Seaview Memorial Park was created to preserve the area from development. Protests were held in the park through the 1980s and 1990s by former Africville residents. In 1983, the Africville Genealogical Society was formed to track residents and their descendants. In 2005, the Africville Act was introduced by the Nova Scotia NDP, calling for a formal apology regarding Africville. Peter Kelly, former mayor of Halifax, also offered land, money, and services to build a replica of the church that had been destroyed. In 2002, the site of Africville was made a National Historic Site of Canada. So the, uh, the replica church 
comes um, as a result of the 2010 apology uh, from the city of Halifax, uh, where uh, the then mayor, Peter Kelly, uh, apologized to descendants and former residents of Africville for the treatment that they received um, uh, when they were living in Africville. So in 1967, uh, while the community slept, the church was torn down. So the community was uh, in the process of being demolished um, home by home. But um, the evening that the church was torn down was uh, not something that people uh, were expecting or were aware of. And, and so even today, when people talk about the, the pain of that um, uh, experience, they still uh, note that as being the the, the, the biggest uh, pain that they experience when thinking about the history of Africa. So, so um, at the time of the apology, the city uh, agreed to uh, allow the replica to be built on the land and provided funds to build that uh, replica. It is a museum and 2.5 acres of original uh, Africa lands reverted back into the hands of the Africa Heritage Trust. This clip from the CBC looks at when the site was designated. Take me back to the place. It was a celebration of African Canadian culture filled with music, prayer, and speeches. It was an overdue recognition of a dark period of Nova Scotia's history. 30 years ago, the city of Halifax confiscated the property of 80 African Nova Scotian families. The city said it was a slum and promised people better services in another part of town. Africville was bulldozed. Residents were told it was in the name of urban renewal and because the land was needed for a new bridge across the Halifax Harbour. Former resident Irvin Carvery was 13 years old when the city leveled his home. He says the community wasn't in the way, the city simply wanted it to disappear. Africville was no different than any other rural community. And, uh, you know, the media of the day came to Africville and took pictures of the worst of the buildings they could find and depicted that as our whole community. Dr. Ruth Johnson was in her 50s when the community was destroyed. She says a whole generation suffered because of the city's actions. This is a happy event for some, but yet this is a sad event for me. The young people think this is great, but to think I've lost my birthplace for a park. Heritage Minister Sheila Cobbs says she hopes that by recognizing Africville, Canadians will learn not to repeat the mistakes of the past. Take me back. Thomas Ledwell, CBC News, Halifax. The Replica Church would open on September 25, 2011. In February 2020, the provincial government announced that the bell that once hung in the original church, which had survived demolition, would be returned to the area once again. We're so excited. So as you can imagine, um, you know, the, the, the idea and the thought that the tearing down of the church was intended to separate the community, to uh, have people move away from the community, um, and that particular bell, we really don't know how or where it was. Was it on the dump? Was it on the rubble? We don't really know. What we do know is that it was uh, taken to uh, Beachville Baptist Church by then Reverend W.P. Oliver, who was also um, a minister at Africville and Beachville. So he took it and he put it in the tower in, in Beachville. And, you know, so here's a community that was intended to be silenced and the bell just kept on ringing from another location. And for that community to want to shepherd that bell back to Africa was just so powerful. Um, you know, it really does um, give you that unbelievable sense of community and resilience and, you know, all the things that, that make us progress and thrive. There is also an exhibit on Africville at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights in Winnipeg, which Matthew McRae helped to set up. We did a lot of work. Uh, we did a couple of things. We had a, a digital exhibit inside the museum. So when you go inside the museum and our Canadian Journeys Gallery, where we tell many, many stories about many different 
you know, human rights histories in Canada, you can go to our touchscreen kiosks and you can see many of those stories in there. And Africa was one of those stories that we tell. Um, and the story of the community and how it was destroyed and, uh, you know, how the residents of Africville have continued to push for justice and, uh, and, and for, mem- you know, remembrance and have remained a community. Mm-hmm. So we also talk about community resilience, and that's a very important thing at the Human Rights Museum that we talk about, is we don't just talk about, you know, it's not the Museum of Human Rights atrocities, it's the Museum of Human Rights. So we talk about action for human rights as well as human rights violations. Um, the other thing that uh, I worked on uh, very hard was the um, the online exhibition that we did, which is the story of Africville. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's available on our website, and it tells the story of Africville. It's meant to be used for you know for people for education, people just trying to find uh, information about the story. We worked with a lot of different uh, people to help us tell that story. We worked with the Africville Museum. We worked with uh, the archives in Nova Scotia and the uh, National Archives for their archival images of Africville and the residents of Africville. So that was very important. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm proud of that I was able to help tell that story. Uh, that was very, it was a very neat thing to do. The other thing that um, the Human Rights Museum did recently was there's been a series that we've been working on called After the Apology, and it kind of looks at different apologies that, um, you know, that states... City, or that the states and the cities and provinces have made uh, for human rights violations in the past. So, you know, you think of, uh, you know, Indian residential schools, you think of um, the Japanese internment camps, but mm-hmm. also you think of Africville because, of course, the city of Halifax has issued an apology for what it did in Africville and admitted that it was wrong. Uh, and so we would hold events where we would invite those communities and we sit down and say, what does it mean to apologize? What are the next steps after you apologize? What is, you know, what is going on in the community when an apology happens? And so we talked about all those things and we actually worked very hard with uh, the former residents of Africville and the, you know, Africville Museum and the wider Halifax community to hold an event in Halifax to discuss those events. And the event is really meant, it's not meant to be kind of a gala, it's meant to be a discussion, uh, it was meant to be um, a chance for dialogue and and, uh, and for people to, you know, express how they felt about what happened, but also how they feel about what should happen next. McRae also looks at what we can learn from the history of Africville. I think well, there's a lot to learn for <laughs> sure. I mean, uh, absolutely. I, I think um, one thing that... Uh, we can learn is to listen to community voices. I think that that's an incredibly important thing because, of course, there was consultation, but this consultation uh, in a lot of ways was the type of consultation that's meant to get a certain result. They're not really interested in hearing what people have to say. They're, you know, consulting. And and one thing that's super interesting about Africa, though, is the fact that the language of human rights was used to push the people of Africville out of their community. Um, and so this is just a reminder that we have to be careful how we justify things. Because just because we, we say, you know, people were saying, oh, well, the conditions in Africville are so bad that it, the humane thing to do, the, the, the right thing to do is move them out because they'll have a better standard of living rather than, you know, provide those, um, provide those amenities that would give them the better standard of living right there in Africville that other citizens had come to expect as just part and parcel of, you know, living in Halifax. Uh, so I think it's important to think about the language that we use, how we justify our actions. Uh, I think, too, it, it brings some lessons about, um, about urban environments and urban planning that you can use more widely, because I'm thinking of places like Roostertown, I don't know if you've heard of that before in Winnipeg. Mm-hmm. Um, and Rooster Town was a largely Métis community, and it wasn't demolished quite the um, same way as Halifax, but the result was the same. The community had, that had been existed since prior to 1900, this Métis community on the edge of, um, of Winnipeg was destroyed to make way for development. And there was now a mall there called the Grand Park, Park Mall that I used to go see movies at. And I had no idea that I was watching films in a place where people's homes used to be and that that people hadn't necessarily wanted to leave but had been forced out. And so I think this happens a lot when you have a marginalized community Mm -hmm. um, that 
doesn't have a strong voice that people aren't listening to, um, often when their voice isn't at the table in urban planning, people go ahead and make decisions that negatively affect people's lives. And so I think it's that's another thing that I think Canadians across the country can learn is that when we are planning how we want to live in our towns and cities, we really need to consider all voices and make sure all voices are at the table. Because unfortunately, the voices of the people of Africville never really made it to the table in the way they should have. And that can be said for other communities across, um, I think, Canada at this time, Mm -hmm. as people were trying to plan, you know, uh, more modern urban communities, which was a good thing. And people saw that as a good thing. But that language, again, got used to justify pushing people out of their homes. And that's where the problem comes. So I think that was a big lesson that we can learn is that racism, that discrimination can be, unfortunately, can be perpetuated without us ever meaning to do it um, necessarily, without ever being aware because you use this language of human rights, of urban renewal, uh, but the actual result is more racism, more discrimination, and also the loss of people. You know, I love using this uh, um, analogy. I think, you know, the, the story of Africville is very much like how the Grinch stole Christmas. You know, the Grinch thought that if you took away the presents and you took away the tree and you took away the meal, uh, people would have no reason to celebrate Christmas. And that's what the city did. They took away the houses, they took away the church, they took away the land, and yet people still come together and gravitate on that land to worship and to be together and to experience uh, uh, and reignite that experience of what it's like to be a a great close-knit community. So, you know, we can do as much as we want to push things in a certain direction, but the universe is really the uh, the judge and the, uh, the controller. Its history may be gone, but it lives on in the people who called it home and their descendants. As one former Africville resident, Irvine Caveri, says, You weren't isolated at any time living in Africville. You always felt at home. The doors were always open. That is one of the most important things that has stayed with me throughout my life. Information for this piece comes from Wikipedia, the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, Canadian Encyclopedia, Vice, The Women of Africville, Halifax, Warden of the North, and Traditional Lifetime Stories. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Canadian History X. If you did, please give a rating and review. You can also support the podcast by going to patreon.com slash CanadaX, that's E-H-X. You can also reach me at CanadianHistoryX, again, E-H-X, at gmail.com. Thanks, and we'll see you again next time.